Okay, so here's the question. And this is in reference to our previous class, class five. Sri Kishwar says that after the second baptism, man becomes a divine being after entering Bhuvarloka. My understanding has been that Bhuvarloka is still Maya and rather corresponds to the astral plane, astral body, and that divine being on the spectrum of wakefulness, clarity, and soul unfoldment is closer to the Son of God on the model in the book. Can you comment on this? Yes. And first, you're right. The closer we get to um, that level or space on this diagram in Sri Kishwar's holy science related to the sons of God, we're getting pretty much as close to uh, what anyone in this current era and age would consider to be a perfect divine being. So there's no question about that. So the question is, why would Sri Kishwar say that Bhuvarloka um, shows uh, through the second baptism or through baptism in the second birth, um, a realization of being a divine being. Okay, well in my mind too, as I considered the Bhuvarloka, I too thought that, yes, this relates to the astral plane. And to a degree that is accurate, it does, as far as this idea of the astral plane goes. However, um, one of the greatest difficulties that we have in a physical body is the realization or the lack of realization that we are more than a physical body. And so as long as we are identified with this body and this mind and this personality and gross matter, uh, we are significantly locked into a state of not really truly being able to appreciate uh, what you might consider to be a divine presence. However, from the astral perspective, there's, there's, there doesn't need to be an identification with the physical body. And so when we go through that kind of, sec that baptism as Sri Shuar talks about, in a way, if we can handle it right, uh, that helps us to see and experience that we are not our physical body. However, it is true that uh, we might have another kind of body, such as an astral body or a causal body. And if we recall from Autobiography of a Yogi, uh, when Sri Tishwar is resurrected uh, and he describes his experience on the um, planet Hranyaloka, he describes that he's working with extremely advanced uh, souls, I think as he puts it, that are working out their, their causal karma. So uh, karma through the causal body. Um, however, once you are awake to the fact that you are not your body, and once you are conscious enough to recognize existence and say a bodiless or astral state or that freedom that comes from that and a causal state and so on, um, it's, it's much easier for you to perceive subtler things such as um, how spiritual things work. For example, when you perceive or feel um, maybe a sense of an upliftment of energy when you're around someone that you consider to be spiritual, well, that's not really your physical body picking up on that. And that's one of the difficulties is we often uh, keep looking for ways of measuring these things with physical instruments. And much of these things can't be measured with physical instruments, but it is our, our astral and causal uh, antenna or our astral and causal body, which is able to perceive these things. Um, so to answer your question, uh, I too thought that that was an interesting concept, uh, but after more contemplation, it made more sense because uh, even when people go through after death states, as far as I understand, once they lose uh, consciousness of their body, uh, if they are existing in an astral realm, um, they tend to have a sense of great love and peace and are, they're able to perceive things much clearer, much more pristinely. Um, and if they're able to direct their awareness through that, they're also able to very rapidly um, progress through stages of awakening. But that requires uh, a significant amount of previous work. 
I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Inception. I saw it a long time ago and it kept popping up um, on my Netflix saying, watch this. So I watched it again. And you might remember in the movie Inception, uh, they're going into dreams. So, so they're, they're doing some kind of weird work with dreams, going into people's dreams. And as you know, when you're in a dream, it's often hard to tell whether you're in a dream. So the big problem with, with this whole movie is one of the main characters, he's really riding that fine line since he does so much of this work of, am I in a dream or am I not in a dream? So he comes up with a token, something that has a particular weight, a particular balance to it, that he knows how it works in the real world. And it's, it's a top, so you can spin it. And it, you know, it spins for a little while, then it stops. But if he's in a dream and he spins it, and it just keeps on going, and it just keeps on going, or it acts weird or something like that, he knows he's in a dream. Now, the reason I tell you this isn't really to get you to go watch Inception, because it wasn't, it was interesting, but not quite as good as I remember it being when I was in my 20s. Um, but you, when I talk about kind of awakening quickly in these other realms or worlds when you're not identified with your body, well, it really requires that you have presence of mind enough to recognize what's going on and to continue on that journey. That is why um, even in meditation, Mr. Davis would always say that no matter what meditative experiences come, bliss, light, nothing, darkness, anything like that, he always said, go, go beyond it. See if you can go through it. Always inquire what is beyond this. And what you'll notice is one day <laughs> when you transcend your body is that if you've spent enough time in meditation, being aware of how mm, the rise and fall of life, how, how your states of consciousness change, how you know one minute you're in a dream, the next minute you're awake, and then you're in a dream again. If you're able to kind of, through the duration of your physical life, get a handle on that, that recognition of, oh, I am dreaming now, but I am still here. Oh, I am meditating now, but I am still here. Oh, I am peacefully interacting with someone, but the real I is still here. Oh, someone is dying and I'm completely overwhelmed with grief, but I am still here. Oh, someone hit my car and I'm really enraged because I just bought this car, but I am still here. It is that, that inner essence, that inner uh, awareness, which always is there. That's what we're aiming to identify with consistently, no matter what changes outside, we don't get pulled into it, get knocked off course. We don't lose ourselves into something. Um, so we always have to recognize that no matter what happens to our body, to our mind, to our personality, the intention, the capacity to meditate or really it's that capacity to uh, keep our sense of presence. The better we get at that in this lifetime with what we're dealing with now, then when the body drops and we forget <laughs> that we drop, that we even had a body, well, there'll be this moment where you catch yourself, oh, wait a minute, okay, there, there's something that I needed to be doing here and that is maintaining my presence so you don't get lost and sucked into the astral realm. And then you lose yourself in all the beauty of it and new desires arise within the mind. And then you end up having to come out the birth canal again and start over again in the physical plane. Now, these are all just theories, but I think they're useful theories to consider because they're encouraging you no matter what to focus on, work on maintaining the clearest level of awareness possible at all times, even in your dreams. And that's one, things that, one of the things that, that yogis can do. And that's one of the values of... Um, uh, yoga nidra is it helps you recognize when you're dreaming. It helps you recognize that shift. And it's a strange thing, really, to be in your body one moment and then all of a sudden even kind of forget that you had a body or a life before that. But then there's something in there that says, wait a minute, the I that I am recognizes that this is more of a projection or, or something else. And then it can center itself again. And it's always about coming back to that sense of center, no matter what's going on. So one of the things I used to do when it came to the idea of dreaming is as I went through the day, I would constantly kind of ask myself, 
is this a dream? Am I dreaming? Not, not to play with that philosophy of the world is a dream and that sort of a thing, but so that the more I asked myself throughout the day, then at night when I dreamt, I was more likely to, in the dream, kind of all of a sudden ask, am I dreaming? Because you see, the things that you think about and consider during the day, they tend to pop up in your dreams. So the more that you're able to explore, am I dreaming? Is this real? E even if it's just part of an exercise, what happens is when you fall asleep and start dreaming, that comes up. Wait a minute, am I dreaming? You don't even know why you're asking, am I dreaming? But it's because you have that, that, that momentum, which is why theoretically, if we consider an idea of reincarnation, let's say that right now you're meditating, you're, you're endeavoring to recognize your true self, the infinite consciousness, sat, and so on. Well, that's just kind of like one stage in awareness and you, your body might die and you go into the astral realms, which is like a dream. And you remember that again and you continue this work and then you come out again in another lifetime uh, in a physical body. And then say this time around 18 or 16, you become interested in meditation again. You don't know why, you can't remember but it's because of that past momentum. Um, so we have to remember that there is, there's everything that's happening and then there's us, like pearls on a string. And the, the more we can keep remembering that string that goes through the pearls of the lifetimes or the dreams and the deaths and so on, uh, the more we no longer get, the, the more we, we no longer care whether this pearl is perfect or this pearl is uh, slightly, you know, different and so on because you know you are the thread anyway it's a long-winded way to answer the question that was asked um, as far as Bhuvarloka goes if uh, through the meditative process you come to the realization of Bhuvarloka essentially what's happening is um, the sphere of electric attributes as the gross matters of the creation are entirely absent from the sp sphere and it is conspicuous by the presence of the fine matters only. It is called shunya, or the vacuum ordinary. If you come to that through your, your spiritual practice and your meditation, what you're coming to is the realization that you're not your body, that you are aware of the fine electricities of things. And that is a, that is a, a wonderful place to be, to continue to explore and to continue to have that upward momentum if we're gonna give it directions. Uh, towards full embodiment of the experience of where the love, the, the area on the diagram of the, the sons of God is. So yes, I can comment on that <laughs> quite extensively. Okay, can you please elaborate on what is meant by the God-sent luminous body of Radha? Uh, this has the relationship of John the Baptist. All right, let me find that. He refers to that a few times in here. There it is. Good thing I've read it enough, I remember where these things are. Um, any advanced sincere seeker may be fortunate in having the godlike company of some one of such personages may kindly stand him as a spiritual preceptor. Following affectionately the holy precepts of these divine personages, man becomes able to direct all his organs of sense inward to their common center, the door of the interior world, where he comprehends the voice like a peculiar knocking sound, the word Om, Amen, and sees the God-sent luminous body of Radha, symbolized in the Bible as the forerunner or John the Baptist. Okay, I can only speculate on what he's describing here. Again, it's sort of how this book is written, which was why we're doing this class, <laughs> to help make it clear. Um, from the Bible, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Now, the idea of John the Baptist, as we keep coming back to it, um, is as an allegorical figure, 
related to the experience and realization of the Om vibration. And it is the Om vibration, um, which is the, said to be the word of God, the word of God. And that, it's always hard to describe these things. That is the first step, essentially, if there could be steps in creation. And so if we follow it all the way back, essentially when we get to Om, we're at that doorway in between things becoming more material and the full merge, emergence, or emergence into uh, the idea of sat or truth or complete being. Um, the realization of complete being. I always have to be clear there because we're always in complete being. It's just, are we realizing it or not? And so the light of Christ or the Christ consciousness is fully one with sat or truth or wholeness or realization of wholeness. So by listening to the own vibration, that is what serves as the baptizer, John the Baptist, so that we may look upon experience feel, become, realize uh, that light of Christ consciousness. Uh, Radha is, from Sri perspective, uh, the equivalent of John the Baptist, the equivalent of John the Baptist. Now that chant that I did, it's on the newest Kriya Yoga podcast, at least as of May 3rd. There might be a newer one coming out tomorrow. I don't remember. I believe so. Uh, but I decided to post a, a chant, um, Radha, Radha, Radha Govinda Jaya, Radha Govinda Jaya, that's it. Uh, and that chant, spirit and nature, spirit and nature. And so Radha is this representation of nature. Now spirit and nature are one in the same, ultimately. Um, Nature reflects the individualized, the separate, the idea of distance, the idea of time, and so on. So Radha and John the Baptist are representative of those factors in creation which are aware of what is true. Meaning right now, many of us, uh, we're down here, in this body thinking that's all there is really we have an idea that there's more because we talk about it. we intuitively experience it in meditation we go deep into it but as we experience more of the own vibration we experience more of meditation we begin to see in a sense the paleness of the world and that's why after people meditate for a little while they start really being driven by money they start being, stop being driven by their hormones. They stop being driven by their addictions because they see, they see it for what it is. They're, they no longer see it as the only thing. So the nature part, John the Baptist nature, Radha nature, um, this is right there in the, the, the idea of the own vibration, which creation has happened, but it's still clear and aware and knows what has happened, meaning it sees, can experience, the creation, but it's also intimately close to and recognizing of what is true of uh, spirit. So, and that's what we're doing is we're, we're moving towards that. Ultimately, hopefully, ideally. Now, another question related to class number four. Uh, I'm stuck on the concept of repenting. What happens as we repent in practice? Well, first of all, again, I, I don't know if this is part of your issue, but it is important to recognize that some of these words have um, certain meanings to them based on our upbringing and culture and so on, which aren't necessarily useful. So it might be that you have to work out whatever your hangups are about the idea of re to repent. Uh, if that's not an issue, then don't be too concerned. Uh, but to repent, just means to change, essentially. It's like um, letting you know, let's say someone's in a relationship and um, 
you know, there was, they, they love their partner and so on, but as time goes on, you know, they have kids, the job wears them down. They feel, uh, sort of a little more empty inside, like, geez, I don't really have the, the, the vitality I had when I was a, a teenager, when life was just full of promise. And then uh, they meet a, another person, brand new, you know, different smile, different look, and they start thinking, wow, that's a, that's a great person over there. And they make me feel alive because they give me attention. And, you know, they're not nagging me to take out the trash. And, and then the, the person ends up getting or having an affair. And it's, it's an enjoyable time, except for all the stress and guilt involved. And then finally, the actual spouse finds out and kicks him out of the house. And so they get kicked out of the house and they realize just how good they had it with their beautiful spouse and their lovely children and how they let the world, they let the world wear them down. And so they come back to their spouse and they admit, they say, I'm, I'm so sorry. And they mean it, heartfelt meaning. I'm never going to do that again. And repenting isn't, I am sorry, take me back. Repenting is the not doing it again, <laughs> you see. That's why um, when people want to apologize to me, I say, look, I don't care if you're sorry. I'm like, just don't do it again. So that's my, when people say I'm sorry, I don't respond to it. When they don't do it again, <laughs> that's what, what I respond to. Um, so in practice, repenting simply means turning away from the mistake of thinking that this world is going to give you everything you want and satisfy you. It's not true. Your gambler mentality or your addictive mentality will think, well, maybe just this time. I mean, think about it. In your life, how many times? I mean, most of you are have a few. Uh, most of you have a few. Let's see how do I do this. Oh, never mind. We got to take care of. Most of you have a few decades under your belt. And if you really think about it, how often have you thought, well, if I move, things will get better. If I get divorced and find a new partner, things will get better. If I get a new car, now sure, if your car is about ready to break down, great, yeah, get a new one. But, or if I just try to get these new clothes, or if I just change myself somehow, things will get better. You understand what I'm getting at. Well, there's this this happens in the world and it keeps happening. That's why people are so addicted to it because it'll give you a little bit and then it, it, it pulls you away again. So the repenting is like recognizing you're an addict <laughs> and you know the next, um, what do they call them? Not hit. Uh, I don't know. I've never been an addict. But the next, the next thing, the next bump. Anyway, the next thing is not going to be the thing that makes it work. So repenting is recognizing that and then living from that understanding. Repenting is having a realization, everything is one, everything is God, everything is divine consciousness. That is a, that is a baptismal moment. And repenting is, I'm gonna live like that's true now and really doing it, not just keeping it in your mind as a little idea to say over and over again, but to really truly do it no matter how it responds but to truly live that way. Um, it's a tough thing to describe, but it, it really comes down to the idea of what do you know to be true? Or what do you intuit to really truly be accurate? If you are living as though that is the case, then you are repenting. You know, there is a reason that, uh, where it is, it just made me laugh when I read it for some reason. Let's see, there's another quote from the Bible. Repent therefore from whence thou art fallen. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. So you, you, this, is, this is where the work comes in. The work isn't just sitting there and cranking out Kriya Pranayams and say, great, I did it. You know, I, I put in my reps. That's not, in the beginning, that's work. Yeah, because most people are lazy and they don't want to actually do it. But once you get that going, I mean, once it's something you do no matter what every day, whether you feel like it or not, well, then the real work comes to, to be 
Well, I read these texts and I have these realizations and I know what is true, but am I living like they are true? Am I really living like they are true? And if you are living like they are true, then you're doing it. But if you're just kind of not sure, kind of keep it in the back of your mind, but you're not really honoring it. You know, uh, maybe there's a family member that you have that really just tweaks you and irritates you to death. Well, if everyone is God, then you have to treat them like God. That doesn't mean you let them walk all over you. That doesn't mean that you even put up with their shenanigans. But that means that you see them as God and you don't take anything they do personally. And then you respond appropriately and remove yourself from the situation if you need to. But still, you're not in the back of your mind thinking, I really wish you were different and you changed so I could like you a lot more. You say, no, you are God too. I don't particularly like this manifestation of God, but you're peaceful inside when you say that. It's not judgmental. And you just accept them as God. And then you move on with your life. So if everything and everyone is God, you treat them that way. You know, when I think about the political situation that we're in today, you know, I don't agree with some of what politic politicians are doing. I think a lot of them are just idiotic three-year-olds, but I see them as God. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it. And when I see people, you know, this is one of the reasons I hate Facebook or social media of many kinds. Uh, I try to avoid it because every time I get on there, I do get on there for uh, like musical forums. You know, I'm all about that because we're talking about music. But in order to get there, I kind of got to go through my normal page and I see all the stupid stuff people are saying on both sides. And I think, you know, we spend all this time criticizing the three-year-old um, people, the, the three-year-old politicians are throwing tantrums that act like children. But people sitting around making that statement, you're being a three-year-old throwing a tantrum, well, that's true. But that doesn't mean when you bring up a sense of like animosity about it and wishing they were different, that's not going to change anything. I, I, I wanted to get on uh, Facebook and, and, and request that everyone stop posting stuff like, can you imagine what's happening politically again? And instead, just hold a sense of love for the people that you feel pity for. Don't, po po don't post anything. Just recognize them as God and know that whatever state they're in of God, that's just what's happening. And that will start to quit. That will start to, to negate or uh, break the circuit of reinforcing that, that behavior. But that's neither here nor there. Um, and that's not, the, that's not the Bible quote I was looking for. Here it is. I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. And the last, and the last to be more than the first. That's also not what I was looking for. There it is. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember that example I gave earlier about the, the spouse and the affair and then repenting. There's a reason I, I use that example because of this quote. Um, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast, in a sense, left thy first love. God is the one thing that will satisfy you. We chase everything. Money, guns, sex, drugs, TV shows, partnerships, uh, vacations, different destinations. We chase all of those things, thinking that somewhere in there, that's where the self is. Because we're so addicted to looking outside. That's why just sit down, shut up, and observe. Be awake and observe. That is where you are going to find it. But that's like, probably even worse than, trying to take an alcoholic who's been drinking for 50 years and strapping in bed without any kind of uh, help. That it's, it's, you know, we think addictions, physical addictions are bad, like drug addictions or alcohol addictions, getting over those, but it is the addiction to the world that we are overcoming. And that's a hard thing to overcome. And that's why there are so few people who practice Kriya Yoga or any kind of meditation and achieve or experience or realize a state of clarity 
because they're not willing to let go of everything except God, because it seems crazy. And of course, to everyone in this world who worships money, sex, power, and so on, it is. You become nothing, but you are nothing. It's just that for 40 to 80 years, you think you are something. But remember, there's eternity there. <laughs> and it's more important to recognize what you are in eternity rather than just for that short four to eight decades worth of time. If you met Ramana Maharshi on the street, you'd probably think he was a bum. If you met Yogananda in person, just coming into uh, meeting him, not having any, any previous experience with Yogananda, you'd think he was freaking crazy. Truly you would. I mean, really, think about the stuff he says. <laughs> think about the stuff I say. Think about the stuff you say to people when you try to uh, explain things spiritually speaking. But the whole point of all of this is that the idea of, of repenting is living what you know to be true not making excuses for yourself about why you'll live that way for these few hours, but not the next few hours, or why you'll practice the yamas and niyamas when you're around your friends that you like, but you're not gonna practice them when you're around uh, people of the opposing political party that you think are ruining the world. Yeah. Repenting means to do it all the time. And when in, in this Bible quote, in what Shri Shwar talks about leaving my first love, it all comes down to the fact that we have left our first love, which is awareness, spirit, clarity. These are all just words, but you know what I'm referring to. And we think that something else is going to do it. Um, it's a hard thing to discuss. And I haven't thought through enough to come up with a really wonderful uh, sermon to give you about it. But it is through experience that you figure this out whether it be through the experience of meditation and withdrawing from the world and getting that, that, that aha moment or that sense of satisfaction or that sense of realizing that you, 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 are, you aren't defined by anything, that freedom that comes from that. If you can get over the fear of that, then you know what I'm talking about. That's why I encourage these practices and to try to do this stuff versus sermonizing you about it because you can't talk people into anything. So hopefully this was helpful to you, Sarah. And if it wasn't, please um, oh, I see you did some write some more, so let me get back to that. And um, I'll speak one more paragraph or two to Sarah's follow-up. Where did it go? There it is. There it is. I thought that repenting might have something to do with clearing of old emotions or conditionings during meditation, like the kundalini clears the system. Well, that's going to happen too, because um, old emotions and old conditioning, that's what keeps you thinking and feeling the way that you do. So maybe you have a, a strong sense of fear about, I can't let go of my, my attachment to money. Who knows what's going to happen? Uh, but you decide to, even though you still have that fear, to do it. And that clears it up on its own. But it may be that through meditation and realizations that you naturally wean yourself away from it. You naturally realize it's not really that big of a deal. Whether I am poor today or rich tomorrow, you have that sense. So repenting does require that you manage that, which means you have to manage your emotions. You have to recognize what your emotions are, that you are not your emotions. And sometimes you have to step up. The worst thing that people do, and I really want to do a talk on this, is they let their emotions rule them. Why? Because we think that who we are, emotionally speaking, is who we are. That's how a lot of people define themselves. Well, I'm this kind of person. I act this way, and this is my presence, and people expect that from me. Bullshit. Well, not bullshit that they expect that from you, but that's not who you are. So they go around sustaining this kind of approach to life just because it's their conditioning that they're comfortable with. Well, I'm just a moody person. I can't help it. You know, I'm an angry person. I'm just afraid all the time. Yeah, you might be, but if you are a yogi, you get over it. You find a way to get over it. So repenting might be recognizing those things and moving through them, which meditation will do on an energetic level, which doing it will do more quickly. Um, and it, it just works itself out with the practice.
Okay. Really need to find a way to make this chat box bigger. Is there a way to do that? Pop out. There we go. Great. Perfect. Okay. Now I can see everything that you've got going on. Okay, on the exercise, you describe where we imagine everything we've ever wanted in life coming true. And now that we've imagined it, we've had it, and it's done. Um, is it a way of fantasizing instead of focusing on the truth? And isn't it possible one could attract things to oneself or manifest them using creative visualization that way? Is that okay? Sure, if you want to do that. Um, certain things are useful, like imagining I am prosperous and I am healthy. You imagine those things, you're going to be more likely to make choices that lead to that direction. And so it's more likely to happen. And then you're more settled and you're able to meditate more. Those are great things. But spending a lot of time in spiritual circles and people focused on creative visualization and manifestation, and in the end, it's just one more thing that you're wasting time trying to make happen versus recognizing what is true. And that uh, exercise where you describe that you already have everything, that you're already fulfilled, that's not, in a way, that's not a creative visualization or creative imagination, although it may work that way. That's not the purpose of it. So don't even, I shouldn't have even said anything, but the point of that is so that you are utterly still and undisturbed by desires because it is in that place where you are still and undisturbed by desires that you will recognize the string through the pearls, that you will recognize what you truly are underneath that 40 to 80 years of personality, where you will tr find real happiness, real happiness, because everything is there and you don't need anything and you are free. So I, I recommend that so that you are able to move more quickly into that state. Um, and then whatever is meant, whatever is, is on the way or, or able to pop up in your life to fulfill you physically, it'll happen. And if it doesn't, it doesn't matter because you're still free. So we, we have to, in my experience, avoid um, trying to visualize things to bring them into our life. I was thinking about this the other day as I was cooking dinner. Um, I don't know if any of you have... Uh, Instagram, but that is the one uh, social media that I kind of like because I only have to follow like two or three people <laughs> and they just post pictures of nature, <laughs> which is what I love. Uh, but I post stuff on Instagram, which is mainly just what's happened today. It's like 12 second clips, it's pictures of the garden or something I've seen on a walk or something I'm cooking. And uh, the last thing I, I posted was uh, my Instapot cooking, like the lid was open and um, Things were bubbling because it was on saute. And uh, I, was, I was watching it and I thought to myself, you know what? People don't know how good they have it. If they just had an Instapot, <laughs> ooh, lightning. Uh, if they just had an Instapot, you get an Instapot. That is amazing. <laughs> Hopefully everyone's still there and I didn't get kicked offline. Let's see. Yeah, still connected. Uh, but if you had an Instapot, I made uh, an Indian dish that before would have taken me two to three hours to get everything put together. I made it in like 14 minutes. Why is that so beautiful? Because if I made all my meals in an Instapot, then I would have so much more time to sit and meditate. I would have so much more time to study these things. I would have so much more time to explore uh, all these truths and ideas and embody them. All the things that we have that save time and energy today my goodness, even if you had just very little, you are in a wonderful place, a wonderful situation technologically to have the time to do the work. And the reason I tell you this is because the idea is to create a visualization. Often I see so many people truly spending time visualizing every day I'm gonna win the lottery. And I'm not kidding, they tell me this. Uh, or I'm gonna meet the perfect spouse. And I've known them for 20 years, and they're still doing it. Okay, well, maybe tomorrow they're going to win the lottery, and it's all going to be worth it. Maybe in five years they're going to meet their soulmate, and it's all going to be worth it. 
or maybe they could have spent the last 20 years realizing the self and then they would have no need to define themselves through money or other people and they would be blissful and free. What do you prefer? I know what your personality prefers, but deep down in there, what do you prefer? Uh, and then finally, what I'll say about creative visualization is um, I do think it is useful for most people who can't find a way out of um, the problems that they're in. I mean, so many things are so simple that if you just start to have a sense of prosperity, well, what happens if you're clear and you really want it, you're sitting around, you don't have any money, you know, I really need some money, I need some prosperity, so I'm gonna, I feel like I've got money, I feel like I've got prosperity. And someone comes along and says, hey, um, I've got a job hauling mattresses in a warehouse, uh, will you take it? <laughs> wow, there's your opportunity to make some money. But what do most people do? That doesn't fit with my creative visualization. <laughs> Whereas maybe they start working in a warehouse and then that allows them to maybe take some night classes to improve their vocation skills and get a job that they can do well that they are skillful at and can contribute more than hauling around mattresses, which is also a useful job. So with creative visualization, I think it's very useful, but where most people get tripped up is they don't, they don't recognize the opportunities that are given to them because their creative visualization is so strong that they kind of say, well, that's not really the way I wanted to see it go. <laughs> so I have some mixed feelings on the idea of creative visualization, but I do feel that people should try to feel prosperous and healthy and free and active. Because when they start doing that, then they might say, well, maybe I can go for a walk today. Whereas they've been sitting on the couch for 20 years and they recognize, well, I walked a mile and I feel pretty good about it. Not much for a lot of us, but that's a start. And then they maybe a few weeks later say, maybe I can walk two miles. And eventually as the years go by, they're a runner. I know one person who drank, who, drank, who smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. I mean, drank liters of coffee. Um, kind of an angry person. And now in his 60s, uh, he loves running, doing exercise, um, trying to be a vegetarian and so on, because he, he, he saw the possibility that it was there. And so that, that positive visualization, that creative visualization gave him the space to say, it, it is easy to take steps in that direction. Um, okay, enough about that. So many questions today. Well, this is great. Seems like it's not quite on the topic of the holy science exactly, but that's all right. Is there any real difference between lucid dreaming where you can consciously control the dream and yoga nidra practice? Yoga nidra is where you are awake and aware, not your body, but you are awake and aware no matter what's happening, meaning if you're practicing yoga nidra, your body may be completely asleep, not dreaming. You're still present. You experience it. Let's mute this. Okay. Um, lucid dreaming is simply when you recognize you're, you're dreaming and you can kind of take over. Uh, they can be related, but yoga nidra is just like life in a sense where you're meditating and no matter what arises, you're still maintaining that state of that witnessing presence. You're still centered within. You're not engaged. Uh, in yoga nidra, you may be dreaming, but you're not trying to change anything. You're just there, present, observing. What is happening to one's consciousness while spending time on the internet? Your brain is withering. Your soul is crying for mercy. Um, life is ebbing out of you. You're wasting time. There, now you know what's happening when you're spending time on the internet. Or, of course, I'm talking about things where you're wasting time, where you pop in, oh, look at that ad. Oh, let's look at this thing on Etsy. Uh, let's chat with someone. Let's play a little game. That's what I'm talking about. If it's your work, it's just your work. So maybe just change the way you look at it. Like when I answer emails, uh, when was it? 
maybe Friday, I spent, I think, three to four hours just sitting there answering emails. And um, I was engaged in the process, reading what people were saying, responding to their comments. And then when I got done, sure, I needed to get up and move and stretch and things. But I was there. Uh, when you're doing other things like scrolling through Facebook or playing games, you're doing all kinds of crazy, stupid stuff to your brain that I don't think is useful. <laughs> Now, of course, there are some games that help to stimulate your brain. I don't know what those are, but they do exist. Uh, for optimal health, do you think we need sex the same way we need water and food? If not, how about more general interhuman intimacy, such as friendship and touch? That depends on you. Um, you know, Melissa, my late wife, she was uh, a massage, well, I was a massage therapist too, but she was a massage therapist and she was a doula. I mean, she helped babies be born. Uh, and she was very interested in sort of uh, neurofeedback. And, um, you know, touch is very important for, for some people, especially if there's not any kind of stigmas or hangups about it. Like being close to someone, skin to skin contact, as she would always tell me, uh, promotes oxytocin, which is a feel good hormone. Again, the difficulty is that so many people have been abused, um, have weird, screwed up ideas about sexuality or relating to other people, that it's, it's hard to, uh, to get that a lot of times. But healthy touch, you know, patting someone on the back, shaking someone's hand, giving them a hug, not one of those weird hugs where you, hold on, mm, not that, just a hug. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that can be very useful. Uh, Interhuman intimacy, such as friendships and touch, it depends on the person. Some people really need to connect to others. Um, you know, there were times when I would spend days by myself alone working on stuff, uh, books or videos, uh, and I just needed to get out and go see someone. So for me, playing music was my way of doing that. And why did I love playing music for that reason? Because it didn't require that I got in anyone's business. We just got together and had a good time. We didn't have to talk and complain. We just made music and it was great. And then at the end of the two or three hours, part of the ways went home, see you later. And then there's that interaction there. Uh, but that's me. Some people need more than others. There's a great book called, um, I think it's called The Five Love Languages. The Five Love Languages. And um, that can show how people respond to certain ways of kind of feeling good through exchanges within relationships. Uh, sex itself is just really meant to be for procreation. Sure, it's fun. And sure, you can lose yourself in it. But that's the problem. It's mainly an addiction for most people. In the Holy Science, Sri Yukteswar talks about one of the reasons that um, people have problems with that. It is good to have a healthy sexual function. But the reason people have so many problems with that is because of what they feed their senses and what they put into their body. If you lived in a place with healthy humans, healthy minded humans, and if you lived in an environment where you had fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh water, um, the running kind of weird psychological things going on in the group, uh, the sexual function would probably be very diminished, except for when it was time to procreate. That's my thought. Those times that uh, I would really, really focus on really limiting my uh, screen time, even for work. I mean, I would just set on this day, I'm going to do my work, but the rest of the time, I'm just going to write by hand. I'm going to spend time in nature. I'm going to meditate. That was, of course, way back when I had very little responsibilities. And, and when I would focus on just eating fresh foods, cutting out all the processed junk, my, my drive was lower, not in the sense that I felt depleted. It was just that there wasn't a constant drive in that direction. And as Sri Kishwar says, there's less irritants within the system, which causes that it becomes more natural. So relationships, depending on the person, can be good, can be supportive. Many people are addicted to relationships, though, so you have to ride that fine line. 
sexuality in a healthy relationship with a, a partner that's willing and you get along well and you are able to understand each other's needs is very satisfying and uplifting. Um, but it's not the same as, uh, as a person needs food and water. So, okay, so repenting does not have to include penance. Well, the penance is not doing it again. I mean, isn't there something in the Bible where someone was a sinner and Jesus simply just says, get up and sin no more? I mean, that's essentially his idea of repenting. Just don't do it again. So he doesn't say go do 30 Hail Marys or uh, do 100 million Kali mantras. He just says, don't do it again. And if, if we could do that, but we have to remember, humans are childish. Humans are childish. They have, they need, many humans are childish. And that's okay, because that's just where they are. But they need sometimes something to do to feel like it's okay, because they can't just say, well, that's it. You know, it's a weird kind of, uh, I don't know, conditioning response that they have. They feel that they have to be punished in order to get over something. When you don't, you just have to make the change and then let the change be there. So sometimes we need penance, and you will know when that's true for you. Okay, so my question, this is related to the focus on uh, losing your true love or first love as related to the Bible quote. Um, is this something we all lose to varying degrees the moment we come into our bodies as a result of Maya? Yeah, I mean, think about it. Why is it that some people, uh, as soon as they hit the teenage years, they start exploring things spiritually, where others don't even get to it until they're in their 60s or 70s? Why is it that some people have a real proclivity to pick up the holy science or the yoga sutras and say, wow, you know, I don't, I, I can't quite put it into words, but I get what this guy is saying. Whereas other people pick up this book 20 times and say, this is so over my head. So for whatever reason, yes, uh, there are varying degrees of forgetfulness. And of course, if we go back to the idea of well, what have you been doing theoretically in your past lifetimes? If your intention has been to remember, you're going to remember much earlier the next time you come around, if you come around. It's like people who are savants on musical instruments. They've probably been doing that for a few lifetimes in that theory. So when they pick it up when they're nine, it just comes out. It's like, wow, well, I've got 60 lifetimes of working at it. So of course, now it's going to happen that way. Okay, so this question deals with where is the third eye? Um, is your focus on the area of the forehead between your eyebrows on the surface, or is it more on the inside? I've always focused on the area between the eyebrows. Uh, you described as being in the brain where the spine meets the skull. Well, it's, the reason I describe it that way is because the, theoretically, the spiritual eye front part is here, and the back part is at the base of your skull. You know, that's why... Uh, you can, if you focus kind of in that plane, <laughs> then you're focusing on your spiritual eye. But if you simply hold your awareness to the frontal regions of the brain, that's going to be enough. The skull in between the eyebrows, right around here, right in here. Uh, does Samyama correlate to the sixth and seventh limbs of Ashtanga, Dharana, and Dhyana? Yes. Uh, focus in meditation, that is Samyama. <laughs> is it a failing on my part that I don't ask deep questions like the one from Donnell and others? All I focus on is trying to strengthen and deepen my meditation to make me open to truth. Is this too simple for Kriya Yoga Apprentice? Um, you know, Donnell is just a brown noser. She just <laughs> likes to ask those questions just to, to make me say, yeah, Donnell, you're on it. <laughs> That's not true. I'm just picking on Danelle. Um, 
but to answer your question, everyone's got a different kind of mind. And um, <clears throat> some, some minds are more technical than others. And that's not a judgment or a fault on either side because you know, to think that someone has a more technical mind is better, that's not always true. In fact, it's, and this is not true in Donnell's case at all, but since you mentioned her, that's why I'm saying this. Um, uh, sometimes it's, it's the, the highly technical questions which are, are, are kind of less useful because they're just trying to engage the mind and brain too much. But you've heard me talk enough about that that I think you understand why I, I, I mention that. Um, trying to strengthen and deepen your meditation practice and make you open to truth, that's, that's, that's perfect. So it's not too simple, it's actually perfect because um, the Kriya Yoga path isn't really that complicated. Uh, and that's a wonderful way to approach it. And I know all of you, I know all of you do it that way. They like it, like Dowie and Thomas, I think many of us have difficulty progressing because we lack trust or confidence in ourselves to affirm our experiences. To a degree, uh, yes, a lack of trust in yourself to affirm your experiences is a problem. But what I found is that it's not the lack of trust in ourselves, it's the lack of trust of what's going to happen if we actually live, live the, the tenets and the principles. Because it's one thing to say, I want to be enlightened, I want to be self-realized. When it comes right down to it, um, if you wanted to, you would do it. Uh, yes, there, there are going to be certain conditions and conditionings and hangups that you have to get over. But it, it's like anything else. I mean, really, if you think about it, think about the people in the world uh, and what they accomplish and what they have to do to accomplish those things. I was over at my parents this morning and they were watching a, a movie and it was about uh, like Hollywood, like an old, it was a modern movie, but it was about Hollywood a long time ago. And it was about this, this actor who wanted to be an actor. And he wanted to be an actor. I mean, with his whole heart and soul, he wanted to be an actor. And in this movie, he worked at a diner for a while so he could be an actor. He worked two shifts so he could be an actor. Um, he even became a, a gigolo for a while because he needed money so he could stay in Hollywood to become an actor. Uh, he you get the idea he's doing things because his goal is to be an actor. He doesn't care what it takes to do that. People who are uh, famous musicians, think about the Beatles. Everyone knows the Beatles. No one's outsold the Beatles. I can't remember how many times they were supposedly turned down to, to be signed to a record, but why they kept doing it. And, and there, there are other instances of that too, of people, you know, really like working two jobs to achieve something. Stephen King, if I recall, did he work at a laundromat or something? But I don't remember, but he got up in the morning, like wrote for four hours, had kids, went to work, came home, got up really early in the morning, did it because he wanted to be a writer. So there are examples of people who want something and they will do whatever it takes to get it. They don't care if it doesn't fit in line with their creative visualization. If they're given an opportunity and it helps to propel them towards their goal, they're going to take it. And if more of us knew that that was true, that we could do that, we wouldn't sit around wondering how is it going to happen. We would stop and we would listen to these talks or we would read the Holy Science or the Yoga Sutras or Roy Eugene Davis's talks or Yogananda's books or Ramana Maharshi's books. And we would stop and we would say, okay, that was nice. Now, how am I going to work that into my life? And, and you wouldn't just kind of pause there and say, oh, that's great, and then move on. You would sit there for, you would sit there and brainstorm until you figured out a plan to try and you would do it. And then you would fail and you say, all right, let's back up. Let's reevaluate. What do I have to do now to make this happen? And you would do it and you'd have a little success and you would fail a little bit until eventually you would get the hang of it. That is the biggest difference between people who wake up to these things and people who don't. And um, 
And we have to embrace that if it is important to you. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to drive yourself crazy. You just have to admit what is true. Do you want more peace? What is required for more peace? Are you going to repent and get that? If you are having all these difficulties in your life, and it's not because, you know, everything's falling apart, it's just because it's one drama after another. Well, are you going to repent and let go of all those things that cause you drama? Nope, not often, because they're comfortable for you. But if it's true for you, you will do those things. So it's not about lack of confidence or trust in ourself. Often, it is more about, wow, what would happen to my life if I really let go of all of my attachments to this stuff? And I'm, I'm telling you this from personal experience. Um, you know, I've been fortunate in that I've, I feel I've been a hard worker most of my life. And so I never had to go ask anyone for money. Um, I was always able to pay my bills, partially because Melissa from the very beginning said to me, if we're getting married, you're going to pay for 50% of everything or else. And I thought to myself, what? I think, why are you pointing your finger at me? Did I, have I ever <laughs> said I was not going to do that? <laughs> but anyway, um, I was able to do that, but I still had an attachment to money because I felt I had to be responsible in that way all the time. And of course, after Melissa decided to check out, I didn't have to. <laughs> but anyway, bad joke. But it gave me an opportunity to say, you know what? Life is too short. I'm not going to stress myself out over these things. And so I let it go. And I found more freedom, less stability in certain areas, but that's not what I'm looking for, stability in this world. I'm looking for stability in spirit. When it came to relationships with other people, uh, I had to let go of attachments to my teacher, Roy Davis, as far as being in a physical form, uh, the love of my life, um, even friends that I made. I just decided, you know what? I'm just gonna let all of that go. And I'm not gonna be attached to anyone. And whoever's here, I'm going to treat as though they are an expression of this divine consciousness. And when they're not there, that's just the way it is. And that created a great amount of freedom within me. Less, less sense of obligations to others and so on. Um, when it came to worrying about even health-related things, uh, because being a massage therapist and Ayurvedic practitioner, and, interested in all these different health routines, of course I think about that stuff a lot. But eventually I said, you know what? I'm not even gonna worry about that anymore because I know I'm not this body. I'm gonna eat as well as I can. I'm gonna exercise. You know, I went for a 14 mile bike ride yesterday. I try to do that a couple times a week, but I'm not gonna worry about it. And that created so much more freedom. Even when difficulties arose physically, so what? You get over it one way or the other. So oftentimes the lack of trust and confidence isn't about ourselves. It's about what's going to happen to our lives if we really let go of all these things and do what we know we need to do for our own realization. But what you find is if you experiment with that and you try to walk through those fears that you have of letting go, you pop out the other side and recognize that was, I wasted so much time on that fear and you feel silly. So building up trust and confidence is part of part of the path. So it's good to mention that. Um, okay. Krishna Das says, every time you chant, but really chant with your heart, a mantra, you are planting the seed of a reminder in another lifetime to wake up and remember your true nature. Maybe we are here now because we planted some good seeds in the past life. I don't know, possibly. I mean, according to my astrology, uh, I, I, I attract good students. So it's just my astrological chart attracting good students. <laughs> um, but the chanting is important, what you just described here. I wouldn't say it's planting seeds in a future life. I would say it's planting seeds for right now. And I, I feel like I've talked about this recently. Maybe it was in a, a previous discussion uh, for this class. But yes, if you chant and you really give your heart to it, <clears throat> 
not only does it balance your nervous system and your body and all these different aspects of your physiology, but if you really do it, you know, that chant, um, Radha, 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 Govinda Jai, spirit and nature dancing together, victory to spirit, victory to nature. If you really chant that and, and, and consider it, well, then when you go about your day after you chant it, you start seeing spirit and nature as reflections of something similar in one whole thing. And that alters how you interact with spirit and nature. Uh, so as far as um, mantras go, don't look at them for the next lifetime. Just look at them as right now. You know, Om Namah Shivaya. I acknowledge with reverence the infinite supreme consciousness, which we call Shiva. Well, if you chant that with intention in your meditation and you really mean it, then when you go out into your day, you are aware of the underlying field of pure infinite consciousness that makes all of this happen and that is within and around you. And so if you live as though that is true, you are moving into what is real, which is the only thing there is, this now, this present moment. So there's some value to all of these things. <clears throat> okay. Well, um, I'm going to ask a question and only respond if the answer is yes. That way I'll wait. So do you have any more questions? If so, respond yes, and then I will wait for your question. If after a minute or so there are no responses, uh, then we will go ahead and meditate together for a bit. Okay, how do we find our best mantra to come back to in meditation? I don't know, pick one that you like. Just find one you like. Um, one that attracts your attention. That, that is an important point. You know, so many people say, find the most powerful mantra. Well, just make it easy on yourself and find something that you can hold your awareness on because that's the point, to hold your awareness on. Um, like all the different kind of meditation techniques that are available out there, uh, are they special? No, they're just the ones that work best for you. So if you find that one, then stick with it. That will make it much easier than say, you know, if someone told me, uh, all right, in order to meditate well, you have to go and that you know, would be a bad meditation technique I wouldn't like. Let's see. Uh, I don't know, just if there was a meditation technique I couldn't do well and they said, you got to do it this way. Well, that's not going to help me very much in the beginning because it's not really holding my awareness. Uh, you start with what you like, and then eventually you recognize that you can meditate anyway. And it, it doesn't come down to what you like and what you don't like. So for mantras for me, uh, whereas in the beginning I had my favorite mantras, now just give me some words. I mean, heck, make up some fake syllables and I'll meditate on that and it'll have the same effect because it's, 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 it's concentrating my awareness, which is the point of all of this. Okay, great, great discussion today. Um, to, to conclude this discussion before we meditate, what I will say is a, a lot of the things that we've talked about have had to do with something other than the holy science. Not a big deal, but um, I believe May 10th, we have either the Kriya Apprenticeship monthly gathering scheduled and then the 13th, we have the Patreon monthly gathering scheduled. Um, and all of you are, are probably either Patreon members or um, Korea apprenticeship students. So save your questions that are more general for those. And if you can't make it to those, just email them to me and I'll speak to them then. Uh, but for these videos, let's keep them focused on the holy signs. All right, so let's go ahead and meditate together. Great turnout, by the way. Seems to keep happening. So however you like, <clears throat> as long as you are sitting up straight, either in a chair or on the floor, just keeping the spine, neck, and head erect, uh, move into your meditation posture. Give your awareness to your breath. 
and feel the breath as it moves through your body. And it can be helpful to take a few deep breaths just to get yourself fully into your body, really filling up the belly into the chest and let it go. Filling up the belly into the chest and let it go. Close your eyes and breathe. And now bring your awareness to your heart. And feeling the heart, on the inhale, mentally chant OM. On the exhale, mentally chant OM. Let your awareness sink into the heart, letting go of attachment to everything that we've discussed, everything that seems so important to you. Right now, you're inviting that presence, that radiance within the heart to shine forth so that you can experience directly what you are beyond all of these changing phenomena that you consider to be yourself.
and lift your awareness up into your throat. Feel your throat. And as you breathe on the inhale, hear and feel OM. On the exhale, hear and feel OM. And let your awareness sink into this point of awareness as you mentally chant OM, following the breath.
Lift your awareness up now to the space between your eyebrows. Here, mentally chant OM on the inhale, OM on the exhale. Now lift your awareness <clears throat> up to the crown. And here on the inhale, mentally chant OM. On the exhale, chant OM. And give your awareness fully to the crown.
And finally, for the last several minutes of our time together, just let your awareness rest in your body, rest in your breath, and be observant and watchful of your current state of consciousness, however it is now.
If you like, you can continue meditating on your own if you're in a good space to do so. Otherwise, again, take time to feel the body, take a few deep breaths. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and go about your evening or your day. I wanna thank you once again for taking the time to be here and exploring this with me and meditating together. And recognize that I wish you all clarity, wisdom, and light. You are awake, you are clear. Just begin living as though that is true and it will become obvious. So thank you all again and we'll be in touch soon.